Just to give a context, I think uh, in the last two days, almost all the speakers have talked about the fact that there are one billion or 15 percent of the world's population are persons with disabilities. Um, of this, at least 80 percent or 800 million live in countries of the global south. We also know that persons with disabilities are 20 percent of the world's poorest. And that's why this session is really important, because the models which all of them will share today impact the world's poorest and the most vulnerable. With the new economic dynamics and the buzz around India and the BRIC countries, countries like Brazil, Russia, China, South America, I think it's imperative that these voices are heard in the UN and multilateral forums, and I would like to compliment the Zero Project for giving space for these voices to be heard in forums like this. Michael requested me to speak a little bit about my own experiences of the last five years in skilling youth with disabilities, and therefore I just thought I would begin the session by emphasizing what is important if you want to work in this space in scale. The first point I'd like to emphasize is the difference about this work is that this work cannot be done if you do not have a passion for this space. Passion is so important that nowadays when we recruit staff, we don't look for people with high degrees, but actually we look for people who, who what I call, um, think the heart is important. There should be passion there. Uh, the second important factor is that more than anything else, over here you need to get the different stakeholders onto one platform. People like the government, the, com the companies, the communities, all of them need to be brought onto one platform because the issue is so complex and multidimensional. It is also important for us to listen to the voices of the people with disabilities themselves, like this forum. In fact, I myself, when I began the work, I thought it's important to do this. So what I did was I traveled across India listening to various voices. The result was the book called You Can, which I just gave today to Martin. Uh, the book is now in its second edition. It's an inspirational book which tells stories of the entrepreneurs with disabilities themselves and chairmen who've integrated disability into their business models. It's also available on Kindle. It's doing extremely well. And a lot of companies encourage me to do workshops around this book um, to, be, to help them begin on their path of inclusion. Um, I've also realized in this work that actually there are no shortcuts in this. You just need to hardwire the processes to make it work. And last but not the least, I think what is important is that all the people with disability need to speak in one voice to create a lobby. Quite often, even in my own country, because disability is one word, but there are various kinds of disabilities people tend to work in silos. So it's really important for us, the way the gender forum is there, to speak in one voice. I'll begin by quickly introducing the three speakers who are there with us, and I'll go in alphabetical order. I have with me Keys here, who's from Netherlands. He has a, he has a, uh, a company which is called Word and Deed. Right, when translated, a bit like Mahatma Gandhi's philosophy, which says that you need to walk your talk, has a global footprint. And he's going to, he's in this forum because he likes being in the global south and his work in Philippines. So over to you, Keys. Thank you, Mira. Um, very nice to, uh, to be here and to present one of the models that my foundation developed. Um, normally, I talk three days about this topic when I help an organization to start with job and business services. So it's very uh, difficult for me to 
give it in a nutshell in seven minutes, but I will do my best. When I prepared myself for this presentation, I was thinking uh, about an experience in Haiti where I uh, was, and I met a director of a very big vocational training center. And I asked him, how many of your students find a job after graduating? And he stared at me for 10, 20 seconds, and then he said, sir, that's not my business. And I said to him, but do you have an estimation how many people find a job? And he said, oh, sir, it is less than 10%. Can you imagine that? A very big technical institute with more than 1,000 students, with a lot of machinery, with teachers, with a curriculum, with big buildings, and less than 10% of the graduates find a job. Well, that's the background of this model. Um, let me let me explain the background by showing you some dramatic statistics of research that McKinsey presented some years ago. Worldwide, young people are three times more likely than their parents to be out of work. That's very general. 45% of students do not find a job that is connected with their training. So they get a training, but 45% of them do a job that is not in any way connected with that training. 39% of the employers identify a skill shortage in graduates who start in their first job. And last, 55% of graduates do believe that they are not fit for entry-level jobs. Do you see that there is a disconnection between the training and the job? And by a kind of conclusion, McKinsey quotes, let me go back. Employers, education providers, and youth live in parallel universes. And why is that? One of the reasons behind is this. Let me give you some examples to, to make clear what is the job and business services concept. If you buy a car, you never go to a car factory, like you see in the picture. So the car market and the car factory are connected by a showroom where you buy a car. I think that makes sense. If you buy an ice cream, you never go to the ice cream factory. But there is a shop, an ice cream shop in behind, uh, an ice cream seller. And now when we turn over to TVET, you can see TVET as a kind of factory. They produce a good product a skilled student fit for the market. And there is the job market. But what is in between? Nothing. And that's where the JBS, JBS, the Job and Business Services concept, comes in. You can see a TVET center as a production unit where skilled students are produced. But they should be sold to the market and they should fit in the market. So we can see JBS, Job and Business Services, as a kind of sales unit. And we developed that in the last uh, 10 years, and we implemented it in many countries. Uh, I'm working for Word and Dad, which is a donor organization, and we help a lot of uh, uh, NGOs in development countries to implement vocational training. And we found out that the vocational training is not connected to the job market, and therefore, we developed a model of job and business services. It's a separate institute, separate from the TVET. And why is that? I was a teacher for 20 years, and I can tell you that education people are normally, generally spoken, inward-oriented. They look to a good curriculum, a nice building, good machinery, and so on, and so on. But they do not look that much outside. And that's the reason that you need a sales unit. Well, very short, what is JBS doing? You can see JBS as a kind of spider in the web. It is networking. It is connecting with all stakeholders, with the students, with the graduates, with an alumni association. If it is not there, it's very worthy to build it because they, have, uh, they are a very good network, they are committed to the school, and they are a good network to find new jobs and so on. They also have to network with employers, 
with the Chamber of Commerce, with the government, and with many other stakeholders. They have an eye on the world around the world of work, and they see what's happening, which are the trends, what is changing in the world of work, and so on and so on. More GBS activities from the job market to TVET. It is not only bringing students to the job market, but also bringing information from the job market to the vocational training centers. Because you need to know what is changing in the world. The world is always changing, and you need to know what is changing so that you can change your products so that they still are fit for the market. So a JBS manager will do a market assessment regularly. He will bring structured feedback back to the training center. How do our products, our students, perform? JBS can organize a job fair where the employers meet the graduates. And uh, when there is a problem with uh, sustainability, um, JBS can uh, organize job orders, meaning that uh, many of our uh, TVET centers have a production unit where they uh, produce things that can be sold to the market, but they are not the business people, so the JBS people can sell the products to the market. And then I'm not speaking about students, but about real products produced in production units in the TVET center. And then from TVET to the job market, because JBS is there for the students, for the graduates. They train the students in issues that are connected with business. Business skills, soft skills, job interview training, uh, and so on, and so on. They help the students to come in an apprenticeship and on the job training. They help students to find a job or to set up their own business, to find a loan in the MFI, to start up their own business, and so on. There is much more to tell you. Please contact me if you want to know more. But I have to go on because of time. A good practice is in the Philippines, where we started 14 years ago with the JBS program. That was a very good school, but inward-oriented, meaning that they had a nice workplace, good students, motivated teachers, but their placement rate was 30%. Then we started with JBS, and now the placement rate is 92%. And companies are calling them, can we please have your students? And in the meantime, this school became sustainable, financially sustainable for 82%. On the picture, you see one of the students that I met, Ariel, he's a very successful student. He was trained, but he was also helped by the Job and Business Services Center to set up his own business. And now he is a web developer. He has clients in Europe and the States, and he's working all over the world. He's able to buy a house. He was able to buy a car. I have him on Facebook, and two weeks ago I saw him, a very proud owner of a car, and he comes from a very vulnerable background, one of the poorest islands in the Philippines. One last sheet. We want to uh, continue and to multiply our model. And the new idea is to have a job booster, meaning that JBS is not only for one TVET center, but for a lot of TVET centers. And that means that we can multiply our model and make not uh, 300 jobs in a year, but 3,000 jobs in a year. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keys, for talking about your job booster model. Uh, our next presenter will be Gopal Garg from Youth for Jobs. Youth for Jobs is a two-time best practice nomination in the Zero Project over here. Um, it's a hybrid model which has a foundation through which the training centers are set and the services are offered through a company. Gopal will talk about this year's nomination. Over to you. Thank you. I take this opportunity to share uh, our work in Youth for Jobs and the best practices. So people were talking about challenges last three days. We have been hearing a lot of challenges of people with disabilities and getting into employment. In India, the challenges are multifold. If you see here, we have a diverse workforce. Uh, we have dispersed population of people with disability. The education levels are low. Companies have deep mindsets to hire people with disability. Hardly 1% companies are presently hiring people with disabilities. 
Also, they, when we started, there was no training model which can be copy-pasted, so we have to start from a scratch and co-create the model. Government always believed in giving subsidies and not investing in uh, people with disabilities to stand on their own feet. So with this context, we believed always that when we started, we wanted to have a model where we bring all the stakeholders on the board. And that's how we started with a public-private partnership model with the state government of Andhra Pradesh, which is one of the uh, erstwhile state in India. So there were two advantages to this of starting with the government. One is government has a huge reach to the last mile. Because people are dispersed, government has a lot of channels to reach out to them, uh, which NGOs cannot afford to reach out. So we have used that strategy to see how we can reach out people to the last mile and deliver the services. Second model, uh, second advantage was in terms of policy, because government frame policies, and I'm going to share how we have influenced a couple of policies which has helped creating more employment. So when we started working, we were very clear that how uh, we are going to bring the market forces into it, how we co-create the training modules, and how we can make it uh, more demand-driven from the from the company side. And that has uh, been an advantage to the candidates because they were getting good employment and placements. When it comes to policy, we have, there is a government program called as National Employment Rural Guarantee Scheme. When they started uh, hiring people as data entry operators, we ensured that there were two lines added to the government GO, the government order which was passed, which says that preference should be given to persons with disabilities. And imagine these jobs were in the local areas, and almost 300 people got jobs locally near their home into this project. So there is a big policy change in the government. Likewise, we have been contributing to various dialogues which happens at the policy level. In fact, the learnings from our program has also fed into the new programs of persons with disability, the sector skill council which government is also promoting now. And it is also taken as one of the best practices by UNDP. So, and the public-private partnership model is a model replicated by other states like the state of Gujarat. And also the dialogues and research work from this is gone into the landmark bill, the persons with disability bill which passed in India last month. So having our lessons learned and building blocks, due to political reason when the state bifurcated and the MOU, what we had government, was obviously not valid. So we have taken these lessons to scale up the program to other states and other regions. And that's how the Center for Persons with Disability model has moved in a large scale model with the Youth for Jobs Foundation model. And when we looked at the program and our le lessons learned, we have concentrated not just on training people, but also on advocacy, also sensitizing companies, bringing them on board, and also actively taking part in various community work or various association level work which happens among people with disability. And happy to share that we have built a scale, uh, we have built a template which has taken us to scale, which involves training, which involves proper reach out to people, uh, which also involves how you handle a person after a person is getting a job through a company intervention. We are five years young and happy to share that we have trained 10,000 people, set up, scaled the program from one training center to 22 training centers in 11 states. We are also recipient of various awards nationally and internationally and presently work with about 500 companies. And most of these companies are first time hirers of people with disability. In an ambitious way, we have started also doing corporate reach out programs and now every month we do four corporate reach out program. And these we do either through the associations of companies or through do uh, HR networks. And this is, a, this is a very important program because in one go we reach out to good number of people. These are some of the companies with whom we are working. Happy to share we have companies who are multinational, national companies. And we started working across the sectors. People never believe that uh, persons with disability can also work on the shop floor. And let me share that two days back, one of our corporate partner, company called as Value, who is a French automobile company, came with us, joined us in the Zero project, and we jointly presented on the Employer's Day, the first day of the conference. And he was happy to share how he was having a lot of inhibitions, but starting with taking six people two years back, now how he employs 77 people with different disabilities into different job roles in a factory. 
So that is a real learning for us, and that's how we started scaling up without any barriers across the sectors. Here is an interesting case study on how we started working with Google, which is one of our a good company now. So Google has something called as a diversity week, which happens in October last week every year. And to one of the diversity week, they invited us to sensitize people about disability. And at that time, we realized that in Google Hyderabad office, uh, which is in southern India, there were no people with disability working. So, and that was a big beginning for us. And that's how we started the role mapping exercise, identified the jobs, and happy to share that now Google has planned to take at least 25% of their people, uh, of their employees across sectors, even the facility management with people with disability. So that estimate to about 650 people. So this is how we start with a company from zero and then take it to scale. And then they start looking at our candidates as an important talent pool. Just to show you some statistics on how we have worked together across the sectors, how the salaries have grown, because the whole model insists on increased salary, career progression, and a proper workplace for a person with disability to perform in the workplace. This is a slide which keeps on motivating us and taking us ahead. Uh, this is the, the most inspiring thing was, is always for us is how the lives get changed. Kiran, for an example, if I take an example, she's with 100% visual disability from a small town called as Surat in India. And she struggled because she's with disability, she's a girl, and also from a poor family. But today, if you see, with a six weeks training program, she works in a company like DMART. And she's a breadwinner for the family now and supports the entire family. In a recent inclusion summit we in Ahmedabad, which is another city in India, she spoke and every time she get an opportunity, she used to tell her the struggles and also how her life has changed now, which is really inspiring and kept us going in this challenging work day in, day out. We have also contributed to a lot of knowledge and uh, the recent report is with Boston Consulting Group, which shows how people with disabilities make business sense for companies. It's available on our website. So in fact, all the reports, if you would like to go through there. We have an ambition plans to uh, reach out to large number of people and large number of companies also. And not just India now, we are, I'm really happy to share that we are setting up our first international center in Mauritius uh, in the month of March, that is just coming next month. So we, are, we got a good local partner to start working with, with all the support there. We have also been sharing our model when we presented in the last Zero conference. We got a lot of inquiries after the conference, and we shared our model with organizations in East Africa. And we were really happy to know that yesterday, a couple of organizations says they started using the best practices, what we are doing in India, and they also got an award yesterday. So we are really happy to share our knowledge through that way. And also now scaling up to different places and trying to reach the most vulnerable people with disability to the best solutions. So these are some of the pictures on how people from different countries are visiting our training centers to see how they can replicate it in their own countries. Thank you. And I've kept the brochures at the back. Anybody interested to know more can pick one from the behind. Thank you, Gopal. Now we have Radhika. And Radhika represents a company which does wonderful work and interestingly, it's, it's modeled as an impact investment enterprise, uh, which assists persons with disability with employment opportunities. So without losing any time, Radhika, over to you. Thank you, Mira, and thank you to Zero Project Conference for having us over. So uh, I would like to begin by telling you a little about our organization. We are a for-profit impact organization. Uh, we work with uh, job seekers to prepare them for uh, employment, and we also work with organizations to make them more inclusive. Our own team comprises of, we have a small team of 32 people, and uh, we have a, a hugely diverse team. We have 60% uh, of female employees, and we have 40% uh, people with disabilities on our own team. Uh, the entire uh, concept or story of Vishesh is primarily of inclusion. We've always wanted to look at inclusion right from uh, inclusion of people from uh, 
uh, you know, socially backward regions to people from, uh, uh, you know, far off regions and also people with disabilities, which, uh, you know, as Mira pointed out, compri comprise a huge population in our demography. So when, when we started off our journey, which was about five years ago, we realized that, uh, you know, for fresher level entry jobs, uh, the basic skills possessed by people with disabilities was not enough to culminate into good employment opportunities. So herein we started, you know, uh, defining a training curriculum which was market driven. Uh, and uh, we came up with three models which we are currently working on. So our first employment model that we use for, uh, you know, training people is the train and deploy model. Uh, here we have, uh, you know, a curriculum which is uh, aligned to customer requirements and we train our candidates on a variety of, uh, you know, uh, topics like, uh, you know, life skills, interview skills, communication skills, etc. And we then take them to the job market for interview. Uh, we've had a good number of placements. In fact, uh, one of our uh, biggest clients is a huge consumer bank which has employed almost 100 persons with disability on their premise. So for us, it's also important as we move along in this train and deploy model uh, is to also build internal capacity of the organization where they can independently start supporting their uh, disabled employees and not look out to organizations like Vishesh to support them. Uh, the second model that we have is the train and hire model, which is more uh, sponsored by organizations. It is aligned totally to, you know, the organization's requirements. It can be very niche skills like IT, it could be, uh, you know, skills from the financial sectors, or it could also be skills which are, uh, you know, uh, very niche like language trainings because they have you know, their operations based out of uh, different countries. So with the train and hire program, we've uh, entirely uh, developed our curriculum, uh, you know, to suit the organization's requirements. We have trainers who come in from the company. Uh, there is complete ownership from the company, which is, uh, you know, the, the good part of the model. And uh, the the employees work on this, uh, the candidates get trained on this train and hire model. So we found this to work very well because it has a lot of ownership from organizations. We've done about seven to eight cohorts of this training across sectors for, uh, you know, BFSI and IT sectors. And uh, uh, we've, uh, what has happened is after we do the training, we also have the organizations interview the candidates. A large number of them get absorbed by the organization itself and the remain, remaining candidates often get uh, you know uh, deployed with other organizations looking for similar skill sets so using our uh, train and deploy and train and hire uh, models we've placed almost 1500 plus persons with different disabilities across 100 top tier organizations uh, the last model that we have the you know uh, uh, is a very specialized model. So in the last session, I liked what uh, Welberga said that, you know, why is it important that everybody needs to work at the same pace and have the same social skills? So taking off from there, our third model is designed to, uh, you know, it's a special model where we look at placement of persons with uh, intellectual disability, persons with autism, and what we do there is we, we do not look at full-time employment. We look at an internship model where the candidates are placed with the organization. The employers get a better understanding of the way the employees work. The employees overcome the inhibition of working at the workplace. Uh, the infrastructure is readily available, there is readiness created for employing people with disabilities, and after a three-month internship, if we find it works well, it culminates into a job opportunity. Also, the important point in this model is, it's very essential to have a job coach who would be shadowing the employee and working closely with the organization for the entire duration. So that helps us to iron out whatever issues that might come out during the employment. Uh, so one of the important things that we've learned in our 
journey is that we are very conscious of candidate aspirations. Uh, Vishesh is a very customer-centric organization. We treat both our candidates as well as our organizations as our customers. On the candidate end, we look at matching candidate aspirations. Sometimes we also find that you know aspirations may not be aligned to the talent of the candidate, in which case we counsel them and we moderate the aspirations. On the employer front, what we look at is we look at the job descriptions, we identify what are the essential functions, what, which are the marginal functions, and we help the organization to create inclusive JDs. So taking on from there, while employment is important and uh, you know, a core part of our work, I think uh, it's not just uh, sufficient to have a diverse team. We also need to look at inclusion. Inclusion becomes a very important part, and we need to create an inclusive ecosystem. So that's, we, we've achieved that through a number of services like facilities audits, then a large number of sensitization workshops, uh, sign language workshops, etc. We also look at, uh, you know, as, some, as, as we all know that no two people are similar, so we look at, you know, uh, coming up with reasonable accommodations that can be deployed for different persons at the organization. The last part that we look at is also, you know, it's not just enough to have employment. We need to look at retention of the candidates. So we look at moving them from third party roles, which is often the case in Southeast Asia, Indian companies employ disabled people on third party roles, not just disabled, all people on third party roles. So we look at moving them into permanent roles. We also look at uh, horizontal mobility. A lot of candidates are happy moving, uh, you know, across sectors in the same roles. The important part that we are now also concentrating in is on vertical scaling, where we are trying to see and work with organizations to see how we can upscale the skills of the candidates. And, uh, you know, we are doing this through simple programs like developing business English curriculum, uh, you know, where uh, we can hone the communication skills of the candidates. So just to summarize, you know, uh, the work of Vishesh, we are, uh, you know, if I put it in a nutshell, we are looking at connecting people to job opportunities. We are also trying to empower and enable them through uh, the right job connections, which are aligned to their aspirations. Uh, we are trying to create an inclusive ecosystem. It's not just about eliminating the differences, but how to integrate with the differences intact. And last but not the least, we're looking at retention and about creating a sustainable model which can be replicated across globally. Thank you. Thanks, Radhika, for sharing this lovely story of Vishesh. And we need more of these in India. Uh, let me begin by asking Keys a question. Keys, your model is one where, which focuses on underprivileged youth at present, and it doesn't focus like the other two models, which are disability focused. So, um, do you have any plans of looking at the TVETs of disability? And why have you not done it? I mean, yours is an, an old organization. Well, I'm uh, working for an uh, NGO which is focusing on poverty reduction all over the world. That's our specialty. We are, we are specialized in vocational training, education, uh, also uh, uh, help when there is uh, natural problems like storms and so on, uh, earthquakes. Um, we have not specialized right now in uh, helping people with disabilities because uh, we leave that right now to uh, specialized organizations and we cooperate with them. In our schools, there are people with disabilities, but I want to say it is not our speciality. That's the only thing I can say. We partner with other organizations that do this. So we have no special plans for this. I'm just here to show my model of making the connection between TVET centers and the job market. Thank you. Gopal, you have worked for several years in skilling like Key's underprivileged youth, and the last five years you've made a shift into disability. Um, what are the differences you see between working in, in the area of disability? 
Yeah, so before starting Youth for Jobs five years back, we were focusing, working with the government for rural and tribal people, youth from the rural and tribal areas, and linking them to employment. When we started uh, working for people with disability, uh, we find it's not at all a copy and paste model because the needs are different, the people's requirement is different, each person is different, and disability is also complex. Having said that, also companies uh, are not ready to employ people with disability easily. So the biggest challenge uh, which we started addressing is how, first of all, you bring companies on board where you show them this talent pool and say, hey, this talent pool also has a lot of potential. Why don't you look at them? And also preparing people with disabilities for employment so that they have the right skill sets which they can demonstrate to the company. So the biggest shift in our program from when we move from rural tribal focus to disability is preparing both the sides, not just the candidate, but also the company at large in bringing them on board and taking them along in the whole journey. Radhika, I'm going to ask you, you see all of us generally in the forums speak about the best practices and the good work we do, but would in fact all of you like to share some of the mistakes which you made so that others can learn from the mistakes? Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, uh, when we started off, uh, we started trying to map uh, jobs to, uh, you know, the candidates. And I think uh, our learning was to not take people for granted. What we need to do is match candidate aspirations as well to keep that you know, be very conscious of what the candidate is aspiring for. That, I think, is very important. We've, you know, currently following this model, we've placed one low vision person, you know, as a chartered accountant. We've also placed some persons with spinal cord injuries in, uh, you know, with the airlines. Uh, we've placed one deaf and blind person, uh, you know, in uh, functions where they're using jaws, etc. That's one. Uh, the second is, you know, we always, uh, we were always trying for corporate level jobs, but we realized that, uh, you know, in India people do why for government level jobs because of the security that it brings. And I, I think that's, that's perfectly fine and we should, you know, mm. allow that to happen as well. Yeah, great. Um. How many time do you have for me to talk about my mistakes? <laughs> um, I just uh, like to mention three of them. Um, the first one is about ownership. We developed the JBS concept in our office in the Netherlands, and then we shared it with our partners, and we uh, gave them uh, funding to implement it, and everybody was happy to implement it, but it was, it was not their ownership. So it was thought through in our office, but not in the south, like we talk about our partners. Um, so the it was very important to go with them along, to give them a good training, to give them a, a toolkit to implement the JBS uh, uh, concept. That's, that's one, so ownership. The second one is that they started with the JBS concept as an NGO. We cooperate with NGOs and we are an NGO. And after years we found out that it did not really work. Why? Because they worked business they work with business things like an NGO, and NGO thinking is very different from business thinking, as I've heard in several workshops in this conference. So you should look to the world around with business eyes, and then you have a good uh, job and business services attitude. So the business mindset is very important, and we lacked that in the first years. That's two. And then number three, um, to have a good model that can be replicated, you should be sustainable. We did not have an eye for sustainability. We just implemented the model. Uh, but now we are on the way that several of our job and business services programs are completely financial sustainable, even making profit in some countries. So that are the three things I want to mention. Thank you. Thank you, Keys and Gopal. Do you have anything there? Yeah, so I think the choice of right partner, because as I have shown you our model is a multi-stakeholder model. So there, if we are working with a local rehabilitation center or for that matter, even a company, we have to be very careful on choosing the right partner. That has been our uh, biggest learning. Second is also we should always put this talent pool of our candidates as a potential talent pool and not as a CSR or not as a 
social cause. So that is the biggest learning for us on how you show the talent pool and integrate into the main HR policy of the organization. So it get mainstreamed into it. Third, also as an organization, we need to be flexible and keep on adapting our model to the requirements. You cannot be stick to one model and you think that it can be copy pasted. Like how when we started, when we tried to replicate the model from rural and tribal, we find it's not working. So we need to be flexible and learn our lessons to change the model to suit the people. So that's the third lesson we have learned. To the public. So Keys, can you tell me um, some of the challenges in, um, or, or how did you build a model which can be taken across countries? Do you need to customize it or do you just have you built a template which you can take across? Thank you, that's a good question. Um, we work in 15 to 20 countries with the JBS model, and sometimes I'm asked to go to other countries to explain there how it works. Um, during the workshops in this conference and also during my traveling around the world, I see in many projects uh, for TVET some aspects of JBS, but never I have seen the complete model. So what I normally do when I start with a JBS, uh, with, with an organization to implement JBS, we do a kind of quick scan from the beginning. What do you have already? What do you lack? And then we make a plan to start with JBS. I go there, I give a training for three days, and we make our own JBS plan, which is contextualized. You cannot uh, copy-paste, that's right. So you need to build it along the, with the context in which you are working. We have a big toolkit with a lot of tools that can be used by starting JBS to start up and to make success. Thank you. So Radhika, what does scale mean to Vishesh? Uh, scale definitely important because we are looking at a huge population and uh, even though we can do small niche uh, placements, I think we need to look at you know, the entire population as a whole. So when we're looking at scale, I think both our models which we're talking about, the train and deploy as well as the train and hire is targeted towards scale. We're also working with the sector skill council so that you know, we can uh, uh, come up with, uh, you know, uh, adopt their JDs and be aligned to their requirements and basically train a larger mass of population which can then become, you know, uh, employable very quickly. Wonderful. Gopal, you have, you know, got quite a bit of scale, five years young, 10,000 youth. So um, how did you do this? How, how is scale achieved? So we always believed in uh, scale and replicating the model. That's why first one year, almost two years, we just spent time in learning our lessons and having those building blocks in place and creating a template which actually helps you to take it to scale. And when we started looking at other states or other geographies, the first thing we look out for is a local partner. The, when I say local partner, these are local NGOs who must be into rehabilitation or who are already well connected to people with disability. Because when you go to a new geography, you have a good platform to work with. And the model also which we thought is how can we build their capabilities so they can own and take up the model. But we are now finding our lessons that it's not easy to transfer skills or to build competencies of people who are already into rehabilitation or other services. So, but having said that, likewise, we are able to find like-minded people and scale it up. When it comes to other countries, yes, we have people, we had people visiting from Afghanistan last week. We had people from Australia. And they say how things are quite different there. And when you have a model, how it need to be customized or how it need to be changed as per the geography is required. Like I still remember my communications with our Mauritius team. So they say how things are different in Mauritius compared to India. For an example, in Mauritius, there's a 3% reservation in the private sector for people with disabilities to have job. Whereas if you see in Indian context, it's only in the public sector we have reservations. So again, because of the geography, a lot of things will change. So when you look at scale, you need to keep these things in mind, that although you have a template, but how it can be customized wherever you're going to. And I think we, are, we have done it nicely, and that's why we have a replicable model now. Thank you. Great. Customization is the key. 
So um, anyone has any questions? Yeah, please. Hi, my name is Irad, I'm from Israel, and I wanted to uh, ask about measurement. Uh, can you please, for, for the whole panel, can you please explain how do you measure success? Uh, uh, for example, the 82% that you mentioned before. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Very important to measure your success and to prove that it is true. We have an online employment tracking system and all our partners use that system. So if they get in touch with a poor student, uh, the details are in the system and then they follow the student not only during the training but also after the training for one or two years and they measure the increase in income and the well-being of the student. So we can, for every batch and for every trade and for every country and for every period, we can measure the success rate of what we are doing. I hope this makes sense. Thank you. At Youth for Jobs, we are very clear. For us, success is reaching the unreached. And that's how, if you see, we concentrate mostly on the rural areas, on the rural population, along with the suburb areas. So until we are reaching the unreached, success doesn't mean anything to us. Second is also how you change lives, how you change from a zero salary to a person start earning eight to 10,000, and in three years you find a person almost doubling up the salary. So how will you embark the person on that journey where the progress begins? And third is also the, for us, because we work only in the disability sector, it's important on how people look at this talent pool itself is a huge success thing for us, from absolute no-no or I can't to an I can. So that transition is a big thing for us, and that's how we measure our success and how we are changing mindsets among companies to look at this pool as a talent pool or a potential pool. To what he says in a simple quantitative manner, because we want to have the figures you know, in our hands, we use technology, and we have a very transparent IT architecture in place which tracks, as he says, the youth who comes into the training center, the youth who drop out from the training center, the youth who get jobs, and what happens to him after jobs. Now, after job, we have a bit of a challenge because what happens is when they change jobs, they don't necessarily tell us, okay? So we're able to track them till a certain period. That's always been a big challenge, not just for me, but for, I think, many others, especially in disability because they love government jobs and, you know, that's their aspiration. So when they leave for government jobs, they don't tell us because they're worried whether we, you know, worry about them leaving private sector jobs, which of course, as Radhika said, we don't. So um, I think tech use of technology is now allowing us to have very transparent systems in place. Radhika? So, you know, as I said, at Vishesh, we look at, uh, you know, our customers being uh, you know, our job seekers as well as organizations. So on the job seeker end, you know, as Gopal said, it would be how many lives we've impacted, how many jobs we've created, and also across sectors, how many people we've been able to place. So definitely metrics on the number of people we've managed to get employed. I think the second thing that we would surely look at, you know, is retention whether we've been able to keep them at their jobs, you know, over a period of time. And, uh, you know, indirectly that also filters on to our uh, employers because if they are you know, continuing in their jobs, then attrition comes down for them and therefore productivity goes up for them as well. So I think uh, number employed and retention. Very important. My, que my question to Van, uh, you... Uh, pick students who have completed college or whatever. Uh, and um, uh, what we see is uh, they're actually not job ready. Do you have a crash course? And, a prob and for example, in technical institutes, by the time the student finishes, the industry has new machines which he has never handled. So how, do you make them job ready? Do you have a crash course or something? The world is changing. And that's what you are, are, are telling, and that makes it m even more important to have something like a job and business services program to see what is changing and to continually adapt your programming to what is changing. That's one. 
Two, we, uh, we have more programs with people from a very, very poor background, and we just train them in uh, simple skills like uh, sewing, tailoring, uh, construction skills, which are not moving that much. But we have also uh, high levels of trainings like ICT. Um, what we do is to connect them with, uh, with the market, uh, OGT, I think you know the OGT system in India as well, uh, on the job training for three months or six months or sometimes a year. Um, so you teach them the basic skills in the training center and then you coach them to go on the job and be trained there for three, six months. And what we often see is that when your students have the right soft skills, good behavior, good motivation, uh, they are in time, they are honest, uh, and they do their work well in the OGT, then they will be absorbed after that. So OGT is for me a key uh, to, to, uh, to, to success. Thank you. Time for one last question. Any question? Okay, if you don't have a question, then I'll just wrap up by saying that all of you who've been here, thank you for being here. And please remember that the impact of these models impacts not just the country, but it impacts the region and the world because the largest population is of, of youth with disabilities or persons with disabilities is in fact in these countries. Thank you.